Thank you, everybody. When I was a little kid, the big thing that I wanted was a horse. And every picture that I drew and every dream I dreamt, every fantasy that I entertained had me on a fantastic horse that was mine, mine, mine. And I thought it was an impossibility that I would ever be granted such a thing. There was a brief time in my early childhood when my parents let me rent a horse and I thought I was in heaven, but it melted away because when I got to be about 16, my interests changed and I wanted to socialize, I wanted to study, I wanted to have a boyfriend, that meant so much to me. And I realized that my, my obsession with horses was not satisfying everything about me. When I got a little older and I got into college and university, I wanted to be a professor. I thought that would be the big divining rod that would take, take me to my treasure. But my grades were lousy. And I wasn't a very good student, really. And I had a big blow to my confidence when I was unable to get into graduate school. But time marched on, and I thought, because I had always been considered a good writer by my parents, and because I'd always loved to keep journals and write in a diary, that I wanted to be a writer. And I tried to write fiction and tried to write short stories. And I tried to get them published, and I failed at it. In the course of that effort, again, my confidence took quite a blow. And I wondered, where am I going? Who am I? When I met my husband, he thought that it would be very good for me to spread my wings a little bit because we'd lived in, I'd been in Seattle in the United States all my life and I was about 30 when I took my first trip abroad. And when we went to, we went to three places. We went to Italy and I thought Rome was so spectacular that when it came time to move on a week later to Greece, I said, I don't want to leave Rome. Why would I do that? It's perfect here. And he said, no, no, there's a surprise. Wait for Greece. And when we were in Greece, I was blown away by the ancient ruins. I was, I thought that I had come to kind of the mecca of culture uh, from the ancient world and the modern world. And then it was time to go to India. And I said, no way. I actually don't want to go to India. I know that there's poverty there. I know that there's crowds. I know there's pollution. I know there's garbage. I, I really don't want to go. He said, honey, give it a try. And within about 15 minutes of arriving in Bombay, I really thought that I was in the chaotic hippie paradise that I had always been dreaming of. I had never imagined such a lively and colorful and fantastic place of adventure. Everything about it appealed to me. The vegetarian food, the clothes, the language, the warmth of the people. I said, this is, this is it, babe, I am not leaving. And on that particular occasion, I was pretty much right. And the year was 1986. So it's quite a few years back. We tried to travel a little bit and we discovered Udaipur a few years later. And I had never seen any place so spectacular. And I wanted to change my life to integrate as much as possible with India. Though both my parents were living and we had family and friends in America, it couldn't happen overnight. But there was something about India that bugged me. There was something about India that hurt me very deeply. And that was the condition of the animals that were on the street. For the first time in my life, I saw camels overloaded and gasping for breath. I saw donkeys whose legs were tied together, who were carrying bags of sand that I could see were almost breaking their backs. I saw dogs laying on the road in starvation, hit by cars, cows who were bloated by plastic that they were eating on the streets and were being ignored systematically. I saw and I thought it was horrible. And in 1999, when we moved to Hawala village, which is just outside Udaipur, as serene and beautiful as the agricultural and pastoral situation was there, I got an even greater eyeful of animal problems when I saw one by one by one mother cows separated from their children and crying 
uh, uh, the moo sound, which I used to think was conversation between cows, is anguish, pure and constant anguish, when the male bull calves were hauled off to be killed at a couple of months old. And they always were. And there was always a story that they were being moved to MP to plow the fields. And it was always a lie. But I didn't think that I could get involved in any of those problems because they were too big. There were too many animals. There were millions of animals. And I was at a point when, when my daughter and I would go into, into a diaper downtown, I spent much of the time with my hands cupped over my eyes and saying to Claire, don't look over there. There's something too painful. There's a puppy that's too bloody. Don't look. It's paralyzed. Don't look. There's a cow with a broken leg. It can't stand. It will never stand. Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. And one day, something incredible happened. I was on the balcony of our house, and I looked down, and it was in, this is in Hawala, in a rural area, so I knew most of the animals that were wandering here and there. A dog raced by, and I could see from the top that I didn't recognize the dog. It was running, and its back was completely split open. I could see muscle. I could see all the way down to the bone. And I screamed for my family, come, come, we have to try anything to help it. And we ran downstairs, but alas, it escaped us, and it ran into the fields toward the Aravali Hills, and it was gone. It was going to die. There weren't too many houses. There were a thousand hills and vales where that dog could go. And that's what they do when they're going to die. They hide. I was heartbroken. A couple of days later, the kid that lived in the house below us came up. It was actually attached to our house and said that there was a dead animal smell coming from underneath the house. And there was a little tunnel kind of burrowed into the foundation. And his dad wasn't there. And would my husband go down and try to remove that dead animal? So we went down and Jim was uh, on his knees and he said, there's movement under there. The stench was horrendous. Something's alive down there. So he looked closer and said, I wonder if this could possibly be the dog you saw. And I thought, no, no way could it be. That's too big a coincidence. That dog ran far away, and it was near death when I saw it. There was a smell of necrotic tissue. And the act of us crowding around it perked it up. It wanted to get out of there. It was afraid. So we said, let's stand with sheets, and we'll catch it as it comes out. So there was five of us standing with sheets, and out it came, and we threw the sheets over it, but it wrestled its way free and got away again. I was devastated, and I then heard an incredible sound, and a door had popped open. What had happened was that dog burst into my bedroom, and under our bed, crouched. And it was incredible that out of every place that dog could have gone, it landed up under my bed. And that was a sign to me as close to a miracle as anything I had ever experienced. We very tremblingly wrapped this dog in a burlap bag. It had necrotic flesh. It was really uh, in a terrible way. And it had a piece of wire had been wrapped around, probably by a person, and it had cut through all the flesh, and it was a re really messy, horrible wound. The only option to us was to go to the Poly Clinic Animal Husbandry uh, Hospital, which is near Chetak, and that hospital is set up primarily to serve farmers. So it does artificial insemination for cows and so forth. And their, do their doctors aren't much used to treating dogs, but they generously cut the wire off this dog, gave it an injection of antibiotics. They had a rusty old portable kennel, and they put this street dog in the kennel. We tied a shoelace over it. That night I came and fed it. He ate heartily, and I have never been so ecstatic in my life. I couldn't wait for the morning to see his progress. And so I raced back down to the polyclinic the next day, and I came in to see him, and the cage door was open. And somebody had let him out. He was gone. In that moment, 
Jim and Claire and I, my family, looked at each other in such despair because that extraordinary, I don't even think it was a coincidence, that calling of that dog to us and us to that dog, the dynamic of that blessed conversation had been broken by incompetence, indifference, lack of will, perhaps maliciousness on the part of somebody else. And if we were going to change that, we were going to have to do something ourselves. Let's create an animal community. Let's call it Animal Aid Unlimited. That was our golden idea, and it was a, it was a momentous moment. But we had a few challenges, such as we had no car, we had no phone, we had few friends, we didn't speak Hindi, we didn't know much about the local bureaucracy, we didn't know the laws about animals. We didn't have much money. We didn't have a shelter or an ambulance. None of the resources that seem so fundamental to being able to create an institution. So I did a little homework, and I found that there was a shelter in Jaipur called Help and Suffering, and I would go and meet the management and see if I could learn how to start. And after I saw the work that they did doing street dog sterilization, some treatment of large animals, it was um, enormously eye-opening, but it didn't have much to do with me because they were 25 years old. They had a very robust board of trustees. They had money funded from abroad, and they had ingenuity and veterinary science and all the things that are essential, and I still had none of them. And I said to the woman that managed it, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to start. And she looked at me and she said, don't do nothing. Do anything. Just don't do nothing. If you have a piece of cotton wool, you can start helping. Don't do nothing. And that was a moment of change for us. And 15 years later, now this, there we go, 15 years later, I wonder if I'm not advancing, oh, maybe I'm using the wrong thingamajig. Animal Aid Unlimited has treated 50,000 animals in Udaipur. We today have 50 staff who are caring, gentle, feeling, intelligent, creative men and women and volunteers from all over the world who come to care. We do surgeries, we mend fractures, we treat wounds, and we also offer permanent sanctuary and shelter to animals who are so disabled that they're unable to live on the streets. And people come and care for them. These are donkeys who have been thrown away as garbage, cows who have been tossed out, unproductive, might as well be garbage. Fifteen years ago, I thought this was a hopeless case. But it's a hopeful case because people in Udaipur called to rescue it. And as a matter of fact, Udaipur has the highest per capita animal protectors of any other city in India because of the work of animal aid. People have compassion already in their hearts and they need a road to express it. They need an easy means to express it. And that's what animal aid has provided. 15 to 25 times every day, people in Udaipur call animal aid to come to the rescue. And we do it. And we see some horrendous things. And with medical attention and food and loving care, Animals not only survive, but they thrive. And that's thanks to you. Animals get in so much trouble when they're out on the street. They're always up to mischief. They have mishaps. People call. We rescue them. And it makes the difference between death and life. And every day, we're honored and privileged and lucky to see animals go from being very hurt to very healed. And not only do we see a change and transformation in animals, but the people that work f with us as volunteers and as paid staff find pleasure and abilities in themselves that they didn't know that they had. It's easy sometimes to look backward in life and see those crossroads and those turning points that changed us 
and helped us become who we are today. But it's not only possible in hindsight, and in fact, we're facing crossroads all the time. My heart was about to burst with the tension I felt about being afraid to help animals. My heart felt a terrible twist when I would go into the city. And I think you may know that twisted heart feeling too when you see children who need help, or old people, or lakes that are polluted, waterways that are, that are dirty. Your heart cringes and twists. Maybe you're also standing at a crossroads, and maybe this is your message, that that, that feeling in your heart, that this is your perfect opportunity to act. That one dog was one in a million, and my turn at trying to help him changed me. I changed. I changed. I was completely wrong about the trouble with helping. There was no trouble with helping. My shoulders were broader than I had ever known. I was more creative. I could write better. I was a, every day a mother, not just a mother once and for one kid. I was able to express myself in arenas more than I had ever, ever really imagined possible. And in conclusion, I, I just want to say that how wrong I was about being afraid, afraid to help. When I took that small step, it changed everything and it made the world and myself a, a person that I never dreamed I could be. Thank you.